Isaiah 9, 1 through 7, but just talking about getting communication right. There's a story about a lady who was preparing Christmas cookies, and there was a knock came at the door. She went out to find a very sad looking man who was thin in thin and tattered clothing. And she asked him what he wanted, and he said, Ma'am, I'm looking for some odd jobs. I don't have a job right now, and I'd like to be able to buy some Christmas gifts for my family. Do you have anything I could do for you? She said, Well, can you paint? He said, yes, I can paint. In fact, I'm a pretty good painter. She says, well, good. Right beside you are two gallons of paint and a brush. There's a porch out back and, uh, that needs to be painted. If you'll paint it and do a good job, I'll pay you $300. He said, that means so much to me. I'll do it quickly and well. She went back to her cooking making, didn't think much more about it until another knock came at the door. She opened the door and it was obvious that the man had done his job because he was head to toe with paint all over his clothes. She said, did you finish the job? He said, yes, ma'am. And she said, did you do a good job? He said, ma'am, it doesn't even look the same. She said, wonderful. Here's your 300 and Merry Christmas. He started to leave, but then he turned back and said, lady, there's just one thing I want to point out to you. And she said, oh yeah, what's that? He said, that's not a Porsche, that's a Mercedes. <laughs> Merry Christmas, right? <laughs> Getting the message right is crucial. And I'm afraid, I'm afraid that the real meaning of Christmas, the message of Christmas has been lost for a long time among us. Not us, but I think the world in which we live. And I'm like you. I love the traditions, the gift giving and receiving, and all the lights and decorations around him. They're my fault. When I first came, I said, boy, let's, let's just make Christmas something spectacular here. And we, we, go, we go extra, I know. I love the decorations, the gatherings, and the parties. But, you know, we don't want it to be that the one whose birthday we're celebrating gets left out of the proceedings. You know, Christmas really is about Christ, isn't it? It's about, you can't even say Christmas without what? Christ. And so let's not forget him today. I want to talk to you about the message of Christmas. Would you stand with me? And we're going to read verses 1 through 7. I will read the first five and you join me on verses 6 and 7. Very familiar. And you join with me. Let me read the first five and you join me reading out loud. Nevertheless, the gloom will not be upon her who is distressed. And as when at the first he lightly esteemed the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, and afterward more heavily oppressed her by the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, in Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of the shadow of death, upon them a light has shined. You have multiplied the nation and increased its joy. They rejoice before you according to the joy of harvest, as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. For you have broken the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, as in the day of Midian. For every warrior's sandal from the, from the noisy battle and garments rolled in blood will be used for burning in the fuel of fire. Now look at verse number 6 and let's read 6 and 7 together. Ready? For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder. And his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice. From that time forward even forevermore the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. You know, we, we, we do a lot of complaining about government today and about what's going on in our nation. But let's just keep, keep up the good cheer in our heart because good government is coming. Amen. Jesus is coming. Praise the Lord. Father, add your blessing to the preaching and teaching of your word this morning. And may you be honored by everything that we do and say today. It ought to be that way every day of the year. But Lord, on Christmas Day, may our minds not wander too far from the meaning of Christmas. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The greatest aspect of Christmas is Christ. The fact that God came down to mankind just so that we could see Him, behold Him, contemplate Him, understand Him, His true identity, and to be blessed by His presence. John Phillips old writer that was from England but lived most of his life here in the United States and by the way was one of the founders of the 
the school over there in Dubuque that a lot of you kids have gone to. I was taught there a lot. He said this, the great mystery of the manger is that God would be able to translate deity into humanity without either discarding the deity or distorting the humanity. You see, he was the God-man. So what is this all about? What is the meaning of Christmas? Well, from this passage and a few others, let me bless you today by just saying these things. One, Christmas means that deity, that is God, became tangible. The birth of Jesus was supernatural. He was born to the right person, a virgin, Isaiah 7, 14. He was born according to prophecy, a woman's womb without a man involved in it. He was born according to the plan of God, and he was born in the fullness of time. God sent forth his son. He was born according to the place of promise, Micah 5, 2, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, too little to be among the clans of Judah. From you one will go forth for me to be the ruler in Israel. His goings forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity. He was born before, he was alive before he was born. He was born according to purpose. Matthew 1.21, Andrew pointed it out, to save his people from their sins. He was born for all people. Luke 2 said this, the angel said to him, do not be afraid. I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And he said it to the shepherds. Because of the manger today, brethren, we know that God is real. Uh, John 1.14 says that the Word, we identify that the Word, we've already preached this in John. John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God. Verse 14, the Word became flesh and He dwelt among us. We beheld His glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. We beheld Him. They, they, they knew truth, but they didn't know the glory and the compassion and love of God until He became flesh and he dwelt among us. Because of the manger, we know God is real. Because of the manger, we know that he can relate to us. He understands us. He was one with us. Philippians 2.8 says he was born in the fashion or form as a man. He took on human flesh. He was 100% God. He never ceased, but 100% man, the God man. And he was like us in human flesh. He can relate to us because of this manger story, because of the Christmas story. Here's what we know. We know that God is relevant we talk about this, and I hear this nonstop, come to our church because our church is relevant. Well, listen, if you're opening up this right here and speaking from the Word of God, it is very relevant. Amen. Because all of us will be judged according to what is written. Oh, it is so important. He is, he is relevant. Hebrews 4.18 is the passage that points out his sympathy. We do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses but was in all points tempted as we are, yet he never sinned. He can sympathize with every broken heart. He can sympathize with the physical pain. He can sympathize with the loss of people he loved. He can sympathize, sympathize with sickness, sympathize with thirst, sympathize with hunger, sympathize with poverty. He can sympathize with everything because we have a God that can relate. We have a God that's relevant and his name is Jesus. He's real. He can relate. He's relevant. And because of all of that, here's what Christmas means. Christmas means you matter. Because it says in verse number six, for unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. We say it all the time. Christmas is all about Christ. Yes, but Christmas is about us. Because for unto us. Let there not be a woman who said, I'm barren. I never bore a child. Unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. Jesus came for you and me. Amen. Hey, God loves you. Can I just say that? Can you, can you just soak this in today? God loves you. God. And he sent Jesus to prove it. His divine son in human flesh. Let me give you another thought. Christmas not only means that, but Christmas means deity became vulnerable. 
Deity became vulnerable. Jesus was born in Bethlehem. I say it every year at this time. Jesus was born in Bethlehem, but Jesus did not begin in Bethlehem. He's eternal. He is the eternal son. Everybody loves the little baby. Jesus did not scare us to death when he came, robed in splendor with eyes like a flame of fire. No, that's what John saw, but that's not how he came. He didn't come with lightning bolts in his hands and thunder from his mouth. He didn't, he didn't look like the ancient of days with a rainbow for a crown. No, no, he came like a baby. Well, who fears a baby? No one. Yet let me tell you something, that that little sweetheart in the manger, we live it out, act it out year after year in classes and Sunday schools and here, on, here in our program that we always do. I want to tell you that that little sweetheart in the manger is the sovereign Lord and that infant is infinite. He's the everlasting father. He was in the beginning with the father. He was before Abraham. He was the companion of John on Patmos. He's the judge of the nation. Yet... He is the friend of sinners. Because of the manger, we met the first cause. We met the first cause, the creator. Colossians 1.16 says, for by him, Jesus, all things were created that are in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions, principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. That means you and me too. We were created by him and for him. If you're not living for him, you're just, you're, 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 you're living in a wrong direction. Jesus is the uncaused cause. Today's science so-called wants to declare that everything must have a scientific explanation. They say there need be an actor for every action. No miracles, no wonders, no metaphysical reality. Yet, they require that the beginning of everything had no actor, had no created, had no creator. There was no cause. They believe that everything happened spontaneously, uncaused. It just happened. They believe this. They believe all other eventualities in the universe need a cause. But the universe itself does not need a cause. It's ridiculous. It's a borders on lunacy. To claim that there was no beginner to the beginning. Because of the manger we know the faithful source, the sustainer. He made everything but he sustains everything. Colossians 1.17, he is before everything. <laughs> and in him everything holds together. You know why everything's working and we don't fly off into space? Because he created gravity. Do you know why there's air, sufficient oxygen mix in the atmosphere? Because he made it that way to sustain life. Animals and bugs and everything else, including humans. I didn't say you're a bug. I'm just saying he made everything. But the point is, is that he made it and he sustains it and he makes it work. And the Bible says springtime and harvest, summer and winter, not ever going to go away till God's done with it. It's no sense worshiping the creation because the creator is making it work. Amen. Because of the manger, we know the final word. He's the finisher. He's the author and finisher of our faith. Hebrews 1 one God who at various times and in various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets hath in these last days spoken to us by his son whom he has appointed heir of everything through whom he made the worlds. He is the final word of God to planet earth. God gave us his word, the written word, but the final word of God to planet earth is the person of Jesus Christ. He is the living word. We better listen to him. Better obey him, better receive him, better believe in him. By way of the manger, Jesus was given to us, Isaiah 9, 6, unto us. By way of the manger, Jesus was sacrificed for us, Romans 5, 8. By way of the manger, and oh, I love this one. This one takes my breath away. By the way of the manger, Jesus was delivered up for us. Amen. Romans 8, 31, what then shall we say to these things if God is for us? Who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but he delivered him up for us all. How should he not with him also freely give us all things? You see, unto us a child was born. Unto us a son was given. And he makes all the difference. Amen. Believe in him. Trust him. Call on him. Jesus is the one that makes Christmas real. Christmas means this. Christmas means God made a way for us back to him. 
Isaiah 59, 2 says, your iniquities have separated you from your God and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. But God has made a way back to him by sending his son Jesus to make a sacrifice of himself to, to provide the right propitiating, the right atoning sacrifice that takes away our sin if we believe. Christmas means something else. It means that deity has become available available. His nature is imparted. His righteousness is imputed. His character can be engrafted. It's given to us. And this is what it's all about, isn't it? The father gave a gift to us. You see, a child is born, a son is given. We didn't invent Christmas. God did. God sent Christ at Christmas and made all of these celebrations that we have possible in the first place. For God so loved the world that he, what? Oh, the gift of God, the unspeakable, incredible, unexplainable, unfathomable gift of God, the gift that just keeps on giving, the gift of eternal life. God gave his best, didn't he? It's hard to give your best all the time, isn't it? It's, it's, it's hard to give your best in your work. It's hard to give your best because you've got bills to pay. You'd like to buy something fancier, nicer. You'd like to just go all out and give somebody. You'd like to just go down and go down and go into the car place and buy your wife or your husband the most fancy car that you possibly would. Just money, is just, it's just not there. You'd like to do more, but you can't. You know, our God is not limited whatsoever. And he gave us his best. He gave us Jesus. To us, his name is wonderful, isn't it? There's wonder in his saving name. What is that word, wonder? Well, it's supernatural, secret, extraordinary. This name points out the truth that there's nothing common about Jesus. Jesus was a common name in the days of his birth, but there was nothing common about him. Uh, he's a miracle man. He is so far beyond our level of understanding and comprehension that we can never figure him out. Yet he can be known by a little child. Don't forget the Christmas story on Christmas. He can be known by everyone. He's beyond knowing, but little children can know him. Isn't it amazing? It seems like a contradiction of Scripture. You never come to the end of him, but any little child can say, I believe in Jesus. He's wonderful. His name is marvelous. His name is miraculous. And then to us, his name is Counselor. There is wisdom in his saving name. The word wisdom means to advise, counsel, to purpose, to devise and plan. It refers to his role as the leader, the guiding force of our life. He's wonderfully qualified for this. <laughs> he, uh, he has the age and experience because he's without, he's without beginning and without end. He has the knowledge. He has no limit. He has the education. He is the source of all knowledge. His price was right. He gave everything. He's always available, Matthew 28, 28. He is always gives perfect advice. I could give you so many verses. His motives are always pure. To us, he's the mighty God. There is worth in his saving name. This word mighty means hero. <laughs> he refers to the one who is strong, mighty, and invincible. He alone is worthy to be our hero for he has defeated our enemies. He defeated sin and he brought salvation to all men, Romans 6, 14 and Hebrews 7, 25. He defeated death, 1 Corinthians 15, 55. He is the first to rise from the dead. He defeated the grave, Matthew 28, 1 to 6, and he has defeated hell for us. He is mighty God. He is the everlasting father. There's wealth in his saving name. There's never been a time when he was not, and there will never been a time when he will not be. He is the great I am. That's a present tense situation. I am before the foundation of the world. I am in the days of creation. I am as they, as they exited uh, uh, Egypt and crossed the Red Sea. I am in the wilderness. I am during the time of the kings. I am in the time of deportation in Babylon. I am when they returned. I am in the New Testament and Jesus was born. I am in these difficult and dark days. And I am when he comes again and calls us to himself. He's the great I am. I still think the best song I've ever heard written for Christmas is Mary, Did You Know? Oh, amen. Amen. He is the great I am. Amen. Jerry, I really appreciate the support down here on the front row. It's really good. <laughs> amen. 
By the way, if you are saved, your life is tied to his. And you will only live as long as he does because we read it last night, Colossians 2 and 10, as we are complete in him. Well, he's everlasting. How long are you going to live? This verse also says that he's our father. That means he's the producer. He's the generator. In other words, he is our source. He brought us into being and he sustains our life by his power. He fulfills his role as our father. How? By loving us. Jeremiah 31, 3, the Lord has appeared of old to me saying, yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I have drawn you to me. How does he do it? By supporting us. Deuteronomy 33, 27, the eternal God is your refuge and underneath are the everlasting arms. He will thrust out the enemy from before you. He does it by sustaining us for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep what I have committed unto him against that day. 2 Timothy 1, 12, by comforting us, I'm going to save that one and preach on it coming soon and providing for us, Luke 12, 32, 32, do not fear little flock. It is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Amen. He is the Prince of Peace. This phrase refers to the fact that he will rule his kingdom in peace. Well, how can he do this? He's the creator. He's the provider of peace. Those who know him know all about peace. If you want to know peace, you got to know the Prince of Peace. John 14, 27, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. John 16, 33, I have spoken to you that in me you may have peace, the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Philippians 4, 7, and the peace of God that passes all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. When God is ruling, we will have peace. We will have peace with God. We will have peace peace in ourself. We will have peace with others. Be kindly affection to one another with brotherly love and honor, giving preference to one another. Why? Because you're at peace. Amen. Amen. Christmas means finally we must decide. Yeah. Oh, well, so you, you can receive the gift or accept it, can't you? John 4, we're told about a woman, we already preached on this, she was, went to the well one day at high noon. She went away from that well after meeting Jesus, ran into the city, and she invited the men of the place to come and see a man. All of her life she'd been looking for Mr. Wonderful, she finally found him. Amen. Jesus is wonderful, and here's why. Why is Jesus so wonderful? Well, he's a physician who never lost a patient. <laughs> he's a lawyer who never lost a case. He's a captain who never lost a battle. He's a teacher who perfectly develops every student to full glory. He's a preacher who always preaches the right message. He's a musician who never struck a wrong note. He's an artist who never misses a stroke. He's the master who always leads in the right direction. He's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. He's a counselor who always gives the right advice. He's a savior who completely saves all who come to him. But have you come? Have you come? Samson said a few moments ago from the baptismal water, growing in a Christian home, went to a Christian school, knew the jargon, knew the lingo, knew all about it. I had it figured out, but it wasn't real for me. Have you come to Jesus? Have you said, you have come to earth to save me from my sin, my sin I confess, I'm a sinner, save me. Right. Christmas means you matter. Christmas means God made a way for you. Christmas means you must decide. And all that the Father gives me will come to me and the one who comes to me. I will by no means, no not ever, never will I cast out. Would you bow your heads for prayer? Dear Father, I pray for the congregation in front of me today. Thank you for your word. Thank you that you came. Yes. It wasn't just Naphtali that was in darkness and Zebulun and Naphtali. The whole world sat in darkness. And the darkness continues. It continues, it continues worldwide. So many that don't know the truth have not had the gospel of the light of Jesus told to them. So we must be on mission with you. 
nationally, Lord. There are many that are in the dark. Bibles available everywhere, Christian radio blaring all day long every day, but still so many not paying attention. They're in the dark. Locally, Lord, there are many that are in the dark. They need us to go across the street and to tell them the good news, to engage with them in conversation and friendship so that we can tell them about the light of life. And then there's a lot of people who individually are still in the dark. I pray, Father, that you would light up their life today and they would call on you to be their Savior and let this Christmas be complete because they have become complete in you. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. If you're here and you'd say, Pastor Phil, I really would love to receive Jesus as my Savior today. Everybody's heads bowed and eyes closed. I, on this Christmas day, I heard you talking these glorious things about Jesus. Oh, and he sounds so wonderful, so mighty, so available, so approachable. Pastor Phil, I want to be saved today. I want Jesus to save me from my sin. I don't want to play games. I want to be in the family of God. I want to be saved. Would you just raise your hand and I'll pray for you. No speeches. Not going to make you do anything. Just want to know, I want to be saved Never been saved, but I want to be. Is there anyone? Well, then there are many of us who already know Jesus as our Savior. Can you just bow your head for just a few moments in quietness? Can you just stop and say, Father, thank you for sending your Son, Jesus Thank you for coming to earth and dying for me. I don't want to forget you on Christmas. Let's just take a moment of silence. Tell Jesus what you think about him.